Hi everybody, John Call here. Well, there's one month left, but the, uh, the players are worlds apart on issues of taxing and spending. And that has big implications for uh, E-12 uh, funding. As you probably have read, the House is uh, proposing a 0.6% increase for inflation. The Senate, 1%, and the governor's 1% for inflation, but he has a lot of other money uh, on top of that. The governor's target, with some adjustments, would uh, advance education pretty well because it would be enough for a reasonable inflationary increase of perhaps 2% and you'd still be able to do targeted uh, early childhood uh, development and other things with the number that he has proposed. I, I go back to the fact that we ha do have a surplus. Now I've cautioned against thinking that that surplus is massive because we have uh, possibly a seven hundred million dollar lawsuit from Kimberly Clark. We have seven to eight hundred million dollars in uh, inflation and there is a need to put a few more uh, dollars in the rainy day fund. But all along I've assumed when I've spoken about the fact the the, the, uh, the two billion dollar surplus number is inflated, I've assumed they were going to put seven or eight hundred million dollars into inflation which they at this point in the legislature have not recognized. I guess that's a problem that goes back to 2002 when the state decided that inflation did not exist on the spending side only the uh, revenue side. I always get uneasy when there's talk about giving it all back massive tax cuts without targeting them to specific areas it's history repeating itself. Um, basically the situation we had from 2002 until about two years ago was a result of that mentality playing out in our, in our budgeting and the fact we didn't recognize there was inflation. Education is a partnership. It's a partnership between the state and local school districts. If the state is interested in doing its part of this, fulfilling its obligation in this partnership, they should uh, fund inflation. Uh, that will uh, help us not have to raise local property taxes to make up the difference. As I said at the beginning, there's one month remaining in this session. Conference committees, uh, because they are so, the, everyone is so far apart, the governor's office, the Senate, and the House, it's almost going to be like matter and antimatter meeting in conference committees. And it's just hard to imagine uh, what's, what's going to come out of it. But one of the great ironies in all this is that as of May 19th, the construction company, J.E. Dunn, is going to take over the capital. Which means if they have to go into special session and delay J.E. Dunn, there's going to be massive cost overruns on the remodeling of the capital. They will probably not be able to use the house chamber next session if they do that, if they delay, because it won't be ready, which means the House may be forced to move the House chamber into the new Senate office building. And of course the irony of that is, that was their main campaign slogan <laughs> in the last election, this unneeded building. So in a way the House majority has a problem. They really need to finish the session on time to avoid being, being put in a position where they incur uh, massive overruns on the cost of uh, remodeling the capital and possibly then using the big hearing room that's going to be available in that new building as their house chamber in 2016. Stay tuned. Good afternoon. Peg Larson and John Paul here. We have reached a point in session where uh, the omnibus bills have been put together in each body. And it's very interesting because the bills are not very similar. Um, the House bill puts 0.6% on the formula, which is $98 million and about $33 a student. And I can tell you that there was um, a lot of testimony from people from every different area saying but this just definitely was not enough money and that it had the bill had to be redone. 
Um, in the Senate, they put 1%, which is about $58 a student, and that's $172 million. And that still had a lot of testimony that said that it just definitely was not enough money. People were hoping for at least 2%, possibly 3%. The Senate is open to doing 1.5% in um, 017. And uh, we will see if any of the targets get changed because there certainly was a lot of uh, consternation about the, the formula, which is the big piece of both bills. Um, the House also changes integration language, and uh, this was a big problem in the House committee as the, this language had no hearing. And uh, Senator Mariani, who was the author of the original integration law, uh, tried to amend it in a couple different ways, and uh, the chair said part of it she couldn't do because it changed their dollars amount and then the other part was voted down uh, on a straight party line vote. The House also did not put any money directly into just preschool early childhood. They put, um, they chose to put it into programs. They put 3.2 million into parent aware. They did a lot of lengthy language on uh, the scholarships and put money into the scholarship program. And they also put money into the school ready, reading readiness, um, 9.2 million. They make changes in the uh, achievement gap in the house. Uh, they eliminate the achievement gap elimination aid is changed to less than 70% of its achievement uh, and integration revenue or what the district actually spends. Um, there's flat funding for QCOMP in the House, which also was questioned as there are many school districts on the waiting list. In the House bill, they also require that they set aside 2% for uh, teacher and principal uh, staff development. And that's just an addition for the principal and um, Obviously, that's been controversial over the years, and we've tried to eliminate that. Then it gets put back in, comes out, comes in. So this time it is also for principals. Uh, they, in the House, they do have the community expert um, language, so that if you look for a qualified teacher and cannot find one, you may use a community expert. That language is not in the Senate bill. It's very interesting because it was a lot of testimony on teacher uh, site-based basically schools run by all teachers and in the Senate they questioned them as to why they didn't just do a charter school because that's basically um, charter school language. In the House uh, the author did finally admit that this is like a charter school within a school district and uh, they are doing it in one school district and they seem to think that that's working pretty well and so they did get some money to do this in other school districts. Uh, do, 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 do. The House put nine million into concurrent enrollment because they think the program it needs to be around and make sure that it stays. So they did put money into that. Um, and the other thing that they did in the House is they uh, say that school districts must uh, transport children with special needs to preschool programs. Uh, to make sure that they uh, receive these programs and so you must transport them. They reduced the growth factor for ABE from 3% to 0.05%. Once again, this was a bill that did not get a hearing, so it was very controversial. In, this, in the Senate bill, which is different than the House bill, um, which uh, will have its finance hearing on Wednesday, it's tax hearing on Thursday, but Chair Weger stated it would not be heard on the floor until the 29th, whereas the House Omnibus Bill is having its hearing in Ways and Means on Monday, this Monday, and is probably on a much faster track. It's interesting because if they do stick to the hearing on the 29th, they're on the floors, um, it will not give them much time to put a bill together, and the bills are drastically different. Uh, a couple of similarities, but uh, obviously big differences in their policy and how they allocate their funds. Um, 
there's some thought that they will not actually be able to put together a bill or if they do put together something that the governor is going to weigh in because the governor did not get his money for universal pre-k and he did not get other things that he absolutely said he had to have um, so if he decides that he's going to veto this bill because he hasn't gotten what is his premier piece uh, it's going to be very interesting because they are technically out of session may 18th and the destruction of the floors are supposed to take care of um, on May 19th. So they could have a really short special session, but it would have to be agreed upon ahead of time. And I know both bodies really don't want to go into special session. If the bill is vetoed and they don't come up with another one, all budgeting stays the same as the year before. So it's not like things won't be funded, but uh, they won't get an increase in anything. The Senate modifies the allocation of compensatory revenue. They allow the uh, school districts to allocate up to 50% of the revenue according to um, a plan adopted by the school board. And the other thing for compensatory, they have a compensatory um, pilot, in which case um, it's a grant program and they have put the number of 520,000 beside Rochester in the first year and I believe it is 165000 in the second year. Both, both bills change extended time to extended support. Um, I have no idea why they change the, the language, but they like to do that every once in a while to keep people on their toes. Um, they put $40 million in the Senate into early childhood and approximately $50 million into facilities aid, which would help everyone and they felt that that was probably their most important piece because it does help all school districts, metro, urban, and rural, and um, that is quite a chunk of money. They changed the health and safety to health, safety, and capital so that you can use the health and safety dollars for things like oh, uh, fire alarms, uh, building changes in code, and things like that. Um, once again, it's been a really interesting week. And it promises to be, uh, the next couple of weeks promise to be very interesting to see how they can come together, if they can come together. Enjoy your weekend.